one universe, please, says a fancy customer as he enters your restaurant and orders a cake of the universe. At first, you panic, but then you remember that at CERN, the particle physics laboratory from Switzerland, there are scientists from around the world, including from here, from Bucharest, who study exactly that. How has the universe started? What it is made of? The universe can be seen as a cake. How do you create a universe? You need a bowl, you need ingredients, and you need to combine them using a recipe. In physics, we have exactly that. The bowl we have, the container that has us all, is called space. The ingredients are atoms, but most importantly, things smaller than atoms, called elementary particles. The keyword here is elementary or fundamental, meaning not made of anything smaller, the building blocks of the universe, such as the electron. And then you need to combine them together using a recipe. In physics, the things that keep us together are called forces. For example, the electric force between an electron and a nucleus binds it together to create atoms, and thus we can exist. This was our beautiful understanding already from 50 years ago. But something was missing, and that was the Higgs boson. It was a discovery so profound that was predicted 50 years ago, explained experimentally a few years ago, and a Nobel Prize was awarded the next year. It was so important. And now our understanding of the universe changed in all these three elements, the bowl, the ingredients, and the recipe. So we are curious why we exist, what allowed the universe to be created and us to exist. And I am telling you this story because I was part of this effort of experimentally proving that the Higgs bosons exist. This is Peter Higgs, one of the theorists that predicted the existence of this particle 50 years ago, the person who got the name to this particle, and I was explaining to him the results of our team from an American laboratory called Fermilab, where I was studying for my master and my PhD, and we were seeing strong hints of the existence of this particle. It was June 2012. One month later, the full discovery came from the CERN laboratory in Europe, which took the lead from the American laboratory, and where I have been a researcher for the last four years. I am an experimental particle physicist, and I felt honored to be part of this generation that for 30 years worked to prove that this theory was correct, and we showed that that was correct. This is the story I will show, share with you today. To understand why it is important, let us see how different sciences answer the question of what we are made of, what are the fundamental ingredients of the universe, and in the meantime, understand how different sciences are related to one another. We can arrange sciences in a pyramid the same way we can arrange animals and plants in an ecosystem, with a few predators at the top, many herbivore animals at the bottom, and even more plants at the bottom. So if we look at sciences the same way, which is the top predator or the science at the top? I would say it is psychology, which says, what am I made of? My consciousness, my soul. But is psychology a fundamental science? No, it is applied biology. Fundamental means not being able to be explained by smaller things. And we explain ourselves through the biological cells. Now, biology is also not a fundamental science because it is applied chemistry. And chemistry is applied physics, and physics is so cool, it has different subfields that fill up half of the pyramid of sciences. What I study is the top, is the bottom level, the elementary particles, the first things that were created after the Big Bang. If you look at time, time started at the bottom of the pyramid and then went upwards. So elementary particles created atoms, which created molecules, which created biological cells, and at some point they emerged intelligence, and we are here to ask the question, what am I made of? And the answer is, at the very bottom, elementary particles. To zoom in on the bottom of the pyramid, we can see now a diagram of these constituents of us and see how they are interconnected to one another. See. When they say that nothing gets destroyed, everything transforms, they refer to atoms. 
once produced in stars atom live forever, and that's quite astonishing. They are shuffled around between difficult chemical components in what they call chemical reactions. And when you have complex chemical reactions with organic components, you call them life. But this is possible because atoms live forever. If they were unstable, we would disintegrate and disappear. So I would argue that the bigger question than the origin of life is the origin of atoms and why they live forever. Because as you see, they are made of the things on the top right, the electron and the quark. Those are the elementary particles that appear after the Big Bang. And those got combined to create protons and neutrons, which created nuclei, which created atoms. They're all interconnected. And what we study is why these electrons and quarks can be combined into atoms. If their properties were just slightly different, atoms wouldn't exist, we wouldn't exist. So we had this beautiful understanding of the forces I mentioned to you, like the electric force, but something was missing, and the story is about this thing that was missing. So what makes the atom stable? At the beginning of the universe, LS elementary particles were moving very fast at the speed of light, and they were going in all directions. It was disorder. So they couldn't stay together, like these bikers. If they wanted to hold their hands, to be connected with each other, they would have to slow down. If they go very fast, at most, they can wave to each other. So something had to appear in the universe to slow down these particles from the speed of light. What does it mean? It means you need to acquire mass. Because mass, or the number of kilograms, is, as we know from Einstein, the property that tells us what is the speed a particle can have. There are only two options, either zero or not zero. Zero mass means the speed of light, and that was how the whole universe was in the beginning. But a few fractions of a second later, something happened, Ma particles acquired mass, even if very tiny, such as the electron, but then they could move slowly, so they could create atoms. For example, if you have a nucleus, there should be an electron around. But even if there is an electric force around the atom, the electron goes so fast, if it had the speed of light, it jumps out of orbit. The nucleus is alone, atom doesn't exist, we don't exist. On the contrary, the electron has a tiny mass, slightly different than zero, and that allows the electrons to be slowed down, to be captured by the nucleus, create atoms which live forever and we exist. So I hope I convinced you that it's very important to understand what slows particle down. That was a big question 50 years ago. And a truly revolutionary idea came from these two gentlemen, Francois Englert and Peter Higgs in 1964. The proof came experimentally from CERN, from the generation of scientists I belong to, and that allowed these two th gentlemen to receive the Nobel Prize. What was this revolutionary idea about? To understand, let's look at an analogy. I mentioned bowl, ingredients, and recipe. Similarly, now we will have a tray which represents our space, and the ingredients would be these ping pong balls of two colors, because there are particles such as the electrons and particles as the quarks. If you move this tray very fast, you can imagine these particles bouncing around, moving very fast. This was the beginning of the universe when everything was moving at the speed of light. Of course, they couldn't stay together to create atoms. We had to slow them down. How do you slow down ping pong balls in a tray? You have to add something in a tray, something that slows them down. In this case, I chose some sugar. Uniformly distributed everywhere, they said space is not empty. Space has something inside, and as a particle moves through space, it feels a friction, it slows down. That was a revolutionary idea. The question is, how do we believe this is true? Well, in science, it is the experiment that is the supreme judge of a theory. So you have to have a prediction that the experiment can test in a lab. Well, what is the prediction of the theory we just mentioned? Out of the two, Peter Higgs had the insight to say that to every field corresponds a particle. So you need some, something to lump together the field, and as in our case the field was sugar, if you lump together sugar, you get some sugar cubes. In other words, these particles are slowed down by the sugar because they collide with the sugar cubes. The field is the sugar, but the Higgs boson, or the Higgs particle, is the cube. 
In other words, you believe the, Higgs <coughs> the field exists if the cubes exist. So we had to test it experimentally. More <coughs> Moreover, you have to have two experiments at the same time. This is how science works, so that not one of them has a problem. It means that both of them see something at the same time, and that is what we did at CERN. So how did we do it? Well, first you need to create the Higgs bosons. So you have to zoom inside the matter. It is a bit ironic <coughs> that the biggest microscope, the smallest, most precise microscope, is the biggest experiment humanity has ever built. It's called the Large Hadron Collider. It's as big as the city of Geneva, 100 meters underground. You have this tunnel which accelerates protons and protons close to the speed of light. So close that the speed of these protons is only three meters per second smaller than the speed of light, which is 300 million. So that's how close they are. When they collide, they produce sometimes new particles such as this Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is unstable. It is very massive. It decays to particles such as the electrons, and these particles move around so the daughter particles can be seen. To see them, you have to take a photo, right? So you need a camera. Our camera is very huge. It's called the Atlas Detector. You see how small the humans are on that scale? It is almost as big as this building. It's a digital camera because it's able to make 20 million photographs every second. We can only blink six, seven times a second. Thanks to electronics, we can take a lot, a lot of photos. Moreover, it is three-dimensional because, as you see, it goes in all directions, so we can make a concrete photograph. So we take huge amount of photographs, millions and billions of so such photos, and therefore, we can analyze them to look for this very rare Higgs boson. So what do we use? We use computers. Moreover, we use supercomputers. CERN, the laboratory in Switzerland where I work, is leading the world in grid computing, big data, data analysis. What do I do in my everyday work? I write software, I analyze data, we make presentations, we give feedback to our colleagues, but it all revolves around data and programming. And after we did this complex data analysis, we found indeed the Higgs boson. This is just an example. What you see here is a photograph in a cylinder that is cut like this, and as you see, it is very crowded. A lot of particles are produced alongside the Higgs boson, and this is why it is so rare to see. But some things stand out. Those four things are electrons that the Higgs bosons decay to. We never see it directly, we see it indirectly, and then we do detective work based on the fingerprints of these particles in the detector and make some conclusion that a new particle was produced there. So now that the Higgs boson was produced, have we finished everything? Can we go home? No. There are still uh, more things to do because not everything <coughs> was still answered. Now we understand that we exist because atoms are stable. Atoms are stable because particles can be slowed down from the speed of light to stay together. The slowing down is due to a field that is everywhere in the universe called the Higgs field. And then this field, we know it exists because we saw experimentally the Higgs boson at CERN. What is next? Well, our great theory is not the whole story. Our great theory is this red shape and this is an amazing theory, never contradicted by experiment, but we know there is something bigger, because we know we haven't answered all the questions. For example, in the universe, there is dark matter, five times more abundant than our regular matter made of atoms. We know that in the Big Bang, we produced matter and antimatter in equal quantities, and the antimatter has disappeared. We also don't know why there are three families of particles, why not two, why not four, but our ultimate goal is to unify all the particles and all the forces into one. So we know there is a new phenomena out there that we don't know about yet, and we know we need the mathematical theory to describe that. So we hope to find something else. Theorists are leading already, proposing hundreds of, of such theories that we are testing <coughs> at CERN. The Higgs boson is a tool in such endeavor because our current theory says there is only one Higgs boson, and we saw one. But some theory says there are at least five. 
out of which one is very similar to the current one. So we moved from a discovery regime to a precision measurement regime. So if we collect a lot of Higgs bosons in the next 20 years of running at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, we can measure its properties very precisely, and then we can see if it is the current theory one or something new, and we hope for something new. We hope for a discovery. What we can also do is space archaeology. The more energy we put in our collisions at CERN, the more massive the particles we can produce, which means the closer we get to the Big Bang. So by putting more energy, we go back in time in our information, and we could search for these new hypothetical particles that could decay to Higgs bosons. So once we discover something, we use it as a tool to discover something else. Last but not least, we can only dream of understanding what is space itself. That was what Einstein asked himself. What is space? What is time? And I just mentioned that the big implication is that space is not empty. Even if you take everything away, you are left with a Higgs field. And it is this field that slows particle down. Could we do it the opposite way? Manipulate somehow the field to change the properties of space? Could we maybe realize that in some extreme situations there could be some exceptions from the speed of light being the absolute speed in the universe? Could we travel to distant stars? It all goes back down to understanding fundamentally the ingredients, the recipe, and space. We live in an exciting time because CERN just starting taking data again, and Romania is about to join CERN as a full member state, and we have this amazing machine that is collecting data for the next 20 years at unprecedented energy, which means an unprecedented zoom inside matter, and we don't know what we find. We hope to see more Higgs bosons, or at least another particle, or some new interactions. We live in an exciting times, and hopefully, we can understand these fundamental ingredients that can give us a better picture of where did the universe start and maybe even the nature of space itself. Thank you very much.